looking for descriptions of teachers and how, um, you know, two ways that we find these statements in the text about teachers. And one way is going into the Samyutta Nikaya and you find def definitions of what you should be hunting for as a teacher, what the teacher should be able to explain and that sort of thing. And this one is just really nicely stated. You'll find it in Majima Nikaya. It's on page um, 308. It's up at the top and it is, um, it starts out here, friends, Sariputta. Uh, a monk has learned much, remembers what he has learned and consolidates what he has learned. And such teachings are good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing and which affirm a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these he has learned much of, remembered, mastered verbally, investigated with the mind, penetrated well by view. And he teaches the Dhamma to the four assemblies with well-rounded and coherent statements and phrases for the eradication of the underlying tendencies. And that kind of monk could illuminate the Gosinga solitary wood. Now the Gosinga solitary wood was an area where they, they sat around a group of solitaries in the moonlight. But when I went to Florida, when I first started working with Bonte, I went to a retreat before I had gotten actually connected with him and I went to a retreat for about five, I got there on the fourth day, this is the funny part, and it was about nine days long, so I stayed for the next five days. But when I got there, an interesting phenomenon was going on because three of his students, longtime students, were walking around a path around one of the buildings by the temple that we were doing this at, and his face was just brilliant, just like light. And so I, I still maintain that if you had a number of people uh, that were practicing the way they were practicing, you wouldn't need a candle in the ghosting of Sala Grove because the light would be coming off the person's face. We often hear people say the person's face is bright when you come back from a retreat. Where did you go? Where is the new spa you haven't told us about? You will hear this, women will say this to us. It's very funny. Like, are you practicing some new makeup or something? No, your face is just like a, a white light, white sort of brightness to it. And it's a wonderful thing. You can see it in the mirror and you don't, uh, I, I stayed in, in Damasuka for seven years without a mirror. It was fun. <laughs> I wanted to see what would happen if I never looked in the mirror. Would ought to go away faster, was my theory. <laughs> I don't know. I think it helped some, but I don't know. I just decided not to, <laughs> from, especially from the point where I shaved my head. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to, that's one statement. Then another one. We're going to go to 141, and we're going to listen briefly, and this isn't too long, of what, how they do this when they present the Eightfold Path, and they present the path um, in the text. So if you look at 141, which the exposition of the truths is where we send you when you want to see, did the Buddha ever 
actually describe all the parts of the Four Noble Truths and the, all the basic words that describe uh, the uh, suffering, did he actually ever define this? And we find that he really did. And if you go to 141, page 1099, uh, from 23 to 31, he did this section on the Eightfold Path, and I found that one, and um, I really kind of like this, what they did. So, and what, friends, is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It is just this noble eightfold path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. As we go a little bit into this, for people who haven't been here steadily with us, we'll make sure we explain a little bit more as we go, okay? Um, and what, friends, is right view? Knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering, and this is called right view. So we say to ourselves, if we're saying harmonious perspective for this one, would our perspective come clear to us, the anatta perspective? And the answer here is yes. The more that you dig into the knowledge of the suffering and the origin of it and this, the cessation of it, the more you realize the, uh, actual, um, the actual part that atta is playing in causing the suffering. And this is called right view. And the right view, the way we put it to you is impersonal nature. For anatta, we say, atta is the taking everything personally and believing everything is part of me and it's mine and it's myself. The atta, anatta, the release of the atta, the opposite, impersonal nature of everything. Now, if you go hiking, if you go hiking and you stay in the woods a while, and you're, you're camping, you begin to realize everything around you is behaving in an anatta fashion. There is a lot of protection going on with birds and small animals and mice and everybody, uh, but the, the anatta is far more developed than it is in a human being. It's totally different. Theirs is a protection issue and a, um, a prey, a, you know, the prey and the animal that's not the prey, the prey and what is it? The predator, predator prey uh, law and the law of survival. And there's a lot of protection going on and it's far more cooperative than you can imagine. I once saw three birds working together to fight off a big bird from flying in and destroying the nest and taking their eggs. Once I witnessed that, I began to understand that there's a lot more communication. When I was in Japan in 2014, there were some men who were shocked that I was doing bird calls back and forth with some birds. They'd never seen anyone do that before. And they said, birds can't communicate. They make uh, calls and they're beautiful, but doesn't mean anything. And I think that's ridiculous <laughs> because I can sit very quietly and as you know, uh, replying back and forth to a female or a male bird and mimicking perfectly. And after a while, they're going to come to where I am and find me. Unfortunately, I'm too big to make a nest for. <laughs> but the fact is, I can communicate with them and they can, they will come to where the call is. So there's something going on that we're not giving credit to. If we want to go a little bit further, if you're in the woods and you're near a pond, you hear the frogs and you hear the small peeper frogs and you hear all the crickets and the locusts going at nighttime and they go real loud. But I bet you never stayed up late enough to hear when exactly precisely the symphony stops. And I did this in Missouri in the forest for three, four nights in a row and became absolutely convinced 
I wanted to get someone to come and record it from uh, the, one of the universities because I'm not lying, all four nights in a row, it cut off at exactly 2.30 in the morning. Exactly 2.30. And it was just like someone had gone dump, dump, dump. And it was off. All frogs, all crickets, all peepers, all squeaking mice, all everybody. It was over. No more hoot owls. Everything turned off from there until about maybe four or five in the morning. About five in the morning, things start up again. So that last part of the night is special because of the low level of consciousness. 25, uh, okay, uh, 25 here, right intention is the second one. And he called it intention for renunciation, intention of non-ill will and intention of non-cruelty. And the, uh, this is called right intention. So the loving and kindness you're doing, everything's working in the right direction with the Brahma Viharas in keeping with the path, you see? And the precepts are lining you up too. These are, that's what I mean. These, these are all woven together as if they are one big uh, quilt. Mm -hmm. Okay, communication is right speech. And that we say communication, abstaining from false speech, abstaining from malicious speech, abstaining from harsh speech or idle chatter. That's called right speech. And then harmonious movement, they're talking about abstaining from us doing physical things. This is like the community version that you're gonna hear in a minute. Abstaining from taking what is not given, abstaining from killing beings, abstaining from misconduct of sensual pleasures. This is right action. So they're talking about it from a general community point of view. This is the basis of the one that we as lay people, we hear this mostly and we hear this in the temples because it's an overall systematic moral and ethical kind of get control of yourselves for a good society you know that's what this one is really about the community version then life uh life livelihood again see they're pointing to your specific livelihood of the group and the noble uh disciple uh a noble disciples abandoned wrong livelihood earning a living by right livelihood. And then there's some specifics I'll tell you in a few minutes. And then what friends is right effort. And that one is pretty clear to us. We know what that is and it's basically the same. However, when you see it printed here on page 1100 or in other places, if you do not know 111, the Anupada Sutta, and you have not realized that that practice is real, okay? You would read this version of right effort and you would come out thinking it means just work really hard and persevere and don't give up type thing. Because listen to the way it comes out in the translation. You will waken up the zeal for the non-arising of the unarisen evil unwholesome states. That's another way of, we say that's basically saying you're enthusiastic about learning how to see the unwholesome state as it arises so you can let go of it. That's what the same meaning. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. The problem is the word exerting, meaning to a lot of people, push the wagon harder. We've got to get it up the hill, you see, striving, okay? And, and striving is the other, exerting the power, arousing a lot of energy to exert mind, to strive. And strive is usually for the man, striving is striving to get as much work done as you can, you see? But in fact, it doesn't mean that kind of actually come out to mean that as much as you see it in these words, as we all know. So the secret to the whole thing when you're practicing isn't that you might be practicing a wrong way as much as an untuned, unrefined way. You have to say it that way so we get clear. I'm not saying what other way of doing it is wrong, but maybe it's out of tune slightly so the engine isn't working as well as it could to get this fantastic journey done, you see? 
Then the next one's observation, and we, but they say right mindfulness, and of course we know that mindfulness in the, in, the, in the sterile version of mindfulness, I call it the sterile version of it, where they did it unbuddhist it, and they came to the conclusion it means concentrate on a point, mindfulness, and they sort of don't separate concentration from mindfulness and the other thing they'll just say is paying attention, but it's more than that. It's a special kind of observation so that you can go back up here into these other definitions and say, I need to be able to see the, uh, how the suffering arises, the cause of it and the cessation of it. That's what you're trying to observe to fully completely understand, not halfway, but all of the way. Okay, the next one is, um, last one is right concentration. And we know that they take right concentration. And when they do take the right concentration, um, that they're doing it in a one pointed way as if the concentration is the most important thing, rather than thinking about what are the variables of how concentration can operate. It's kind of like the, the, the tension that is in a, a Swiss watch to move the parts turning. If you see the inside of an old style Swiss watch, it's not the same amount of um, power as you would need to turn the gears in a truck. You need a lot more. But the question is how much do you need for this practice to allow you to see what you need to see? And I'm gonna work off for the I think the first one we go to the share board here and we are going to, we're going to use this document, but we're not going to, um, we're not going to actually read the whole thing probably. So I just touched on the general presentation and the general presentation of the Noble Eightfold Path first. And and what I've done for tonight is set you up for a general presentation, then a meditation presentation, and lastly, what can actually, what is the smallest version we know about of an example of the of practicing the Eightfold Path. And then the final piece was a conclusion that I found out I wrote in 2010. I didn't even know I was still there. And so that's a kind of cool thing. It's a capsule. Of, of the Eightfold Path. So, so what I could say, many of us have heard the presentation of the Eightfold Path before, and, and we were growing up in a general community, if we're Buddhist, and, and this is how we usually hear the path, uh, teaching at Sunday school or at temple or in a big celebration if, or, or also in the big tents if you go many people choose to just teach precepts and eightfold paths. So you hear that version. And because you're touching in one tent, I was teaching 10,000 people. Well, they're almost all farmers and workers, and we don't know how much they know or not. And they're not connected to any temples and where I was doing this. So what you give them the, the five precepts and show them steps for within the framework of their community because they don't have anyone else to go to. A lot of monks wander, but a lot of a few only a few monks stay put and actually teach on a steady basis, like what we're trying to do here. So it, the the teaching for the community is taught for the general comfort of the many people that are in one place. And I heard this given in very large gatherings, as I said, in the tents, and it makes perfect sense. So when we view it, this one sounds almost like the same one in the text. This was written by a, um, an author who um, was a, oops, wait a minute. This is, I think, I'm not sure, but I think he's an Indian, um, P.L. Dahar, D-H-A-R. And he had a book called The Buddha for Inquisitive Minds. The Buddha uh, for Inquisitive Minds. I don't know if you can see that or not. Okay, and um, so the breakdown for breaking this down, what they usually do with the Eightfold Path, there's nothing wrong with this as long as they stay, continue to use all eight pieces. This is what 
that's really important. It's okay for you to break it into pieces of understanding. The first two pieces, the wise view, he, he's using the term wise when he does it. Wise view and wise resolve, okay? And he's saying wise view is the fold is taught as skillful means in life and unskillful means in life and learning the difference between them. Just the average community, this is important. It is an unskillful to act through greed and anger and irritability, recklessness or envy, hatred, over eagerness and pride. These are the things that lead us to states of unhappiness. I like this because he uses simple words. And it is, un, it is skillful to practice generosity and kindness, humility, compatibility, joy, flexibility, and compassion. We think about your workplace, think about your home, your friends group of friends. This is how you wanna live and compassion in, in increase your happiness and the happiness of others. So that's the first one they say. The second one they teach is wise resolve. It is helpful to keep a strong willpower to change from unwholesome thoughts, states and actions and embrace the previous wholesome actions that lead to our happiness and the happiness of others. You go to the Dwayta Vitaka Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 19, and in the front section of that one, we always point to that and say, when, when Siddhartha was still a bodhisattva, he decided to check out what it's like to live in unwholesome states or wholesome states. And that sutta led him to understand the importance, I believe, of the precepts and the Eightfold Path. So they're all reflecting on each other. As you listen to this, you hear them reflecting on each other. The third one is wise speech. And of course, it's confined to speaking for the community, just your speaking, abstaining from falsehoods, backbiting, divisive words, harsh speech, frivolous speech. Let's translate that a little bit. Falsehoods would be lying, backbiting would be gossiping, divisive words are slander, harsh speech is harsh speech or cursing, frivolous speech is just sitting around talking about just everything and actually if you ever wanted me to do that, if somebody asked me to, I have almost a half a page, a list of all the things the Buddha said were not worth talking about. And at the beginning of retreats, what we do is we put that in the front of your retreat book for you to see there's not much left to do except Dhamma, Dhamma, or Dhamma. That's the idea. Okay, the fourth one is wise action, abstaining from violence, stealing, sexual misconduct, and intoxicants. And these lead to multiple complications for you and problems. So rather than live with those problems, which will then cause you to have hindrances from breaking the precepts, it's just easy to, to practice staying away from these things. The next one is wise livelihood. And this one was very cut and dry. In the beginning, this was very clear and very concise. Do not sell meat. Do not sell poisons intoxicants, arms, ammunition, non-payment of your taxes. Do not accept bribes and do not steal. And these led to unhappiness for yourself and others. Practicing the other side of that is advised. Wise striving is practicing the six R's and their six R's, their, their right effort was complete completing right effort very nicely, but only in support of the above factors we just mentioned. This is what I want you to understand. When they were teaching the community, they were teaching the striving had to do with uh, the, the completion of the Eightfold Path, the development and completion of it. 
So it didn't have to do with anything further than that framework. Okay, wise mindfulness is taught, and this is taught to encourage paying attention. Here it goes all the way down to the bare basis. Pay attention to all of the behavior, the manners, and the laws of your community in that context of the Eightfold Path. And the last one was wise concentration, community, short meditation periods for the purpose of calming down the mind for ceremonies and meetings and developing this concentration is taught for restraint in connection with the Eightfold Path we just said above. And it's taught for community training, for all types of things, camps, everything you do, skills, trades, learning, everything. And for community, uh, for striving by abandonment of all of the unwholesome and unskillful things listed in the path and for your protection from the disturbances and distractions in life. So for, that's what it means by for your protection from the disturbances and distractions of life if you break the Eightfold Path. So the best thing to live, the best advice for all people, including us, is to keep, abide by these things that are listed in, in this Eightfold Path. And when I teach you the next one and you see how it is, it is, it is put together specifically for the construct, as a construct to support your success in meditation. So it, it's gonna sound very different, okay? So now when we go down here, the second version, if it'll come up, whoop, there it came up, okay. The second version, the second version, this, uh, the, this is the eightfold, noble eightfold path for the sake of my meditation development specifically. So it was designed, we designed it specifically targeting your meditation. The second way uh, that we look at this noble path is specifically meant for meditation development, pertaining here to the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. If you took this idea and you applied it to some other meditation, that'd be fine too. It might sound a little different, uh, but, but the idea is the same. And you'll find things that reflect how, because these are all woven together, these parts and everything, you'll find the reflection of this is in the text that had to be drawn out. And this is interesting because we like to assume that everything he wanted us to learn was spelled out A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> But and nothing was there for us to discover beyond what he said. And this has gotten very confusing because some people will take one sutta and say, well, that sutta is all of Buddhism. And that's it's not possible. It's not possible. Because all the pieces have to be understood to see how they fit together and which ones are the vital ones to fit together so that it will support you to go down the path easily to be able all the way to Nibbana, the experience of Nibbana. So this one, okay. Um, number one, I've done it this way so you can all catch it easily. The, on the left side is the old name. On the right side is the new name that Bhante uh, created for the Eightfold Path. So right view is practiced as harmonious perspective. And when you smile, uh, you are choosing a perspective. Let me make this bigger. You choose a, a perspective. We choose our own perspective habitually or here and now, if we have a trained mind, we choose our perspective and practice with it to, till it becomes automatic. And this is our choice. A positive perspective helps us live with peak performance for body and mind. This is a major key to living a happy life. Important 
for body and mind to lighten up and stay strong in a crisis. Don't take things personally because it will only weigh you down. Never mind more often and just smile. Remember Anicca, things keep changing all the time. Please remember Anicca, buy a bracelet and punch out the letters Anicca and wear it all the time. Because no matter what is going on, how distressed you are, how much somebody gets you upset, you have it right there on your, on your arm. This is going to change in just a few minutes. This is not permanent. It is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. This is affected by the law of Anicca. That's pretty neat. Once we really get that, our mind gets that, we don't hold on so tightly to things from the past, and the past can mean this morning. It doesn't have to mean, it doesn't have to mean last life or something like that. The next one is harmonious imaging. Right thought is practiced as harmonious imaging by smiling when a negative thought arises in a pinch we can choose to never mind, relax, and bring up an opposite positive smile. Mind is the forerunner of all states. We are testing this by continually retraining mind to keep positive thoughts first in mind, in our mind, and remember Anicca. Everything changes. Nothing stays forever. Smiling lightens your mind and it sharpens your awareness for clear mindfulness observation. This is verified by a lot of different research that the smiling will clear the mind and sharpen your ability of awareness, of sensitivity to the change in attention and tightness. Right speech is practiced as harmonious communication. Whenever the urge arises for unwholesome speech, never mind it. Relax instead and keep smiling lightly for success. Speech is the divine opportunity for the word carrot. Now this is a simile I have to tell you in a minute. Personal restraining of your mind must go on all the time for it to change direction and become automatic. Repetition, repetition of the six R's, right? At the core, every smile is practicing good form of communication with an impersonal perspective. This is so important. All forms of communication grow stronger with mind, speech, and body as you practice smiling. So what is this speech is the divine opportunity for the word carrot? <laughs> I had an uncle and he was a sailor. He was in the Navy. And of course in the Navy, a lot of people do a lot of cussing on ships and very harsh language, just really bad. So this is a bunch of men and, and they, they let it go to a certain extent and it still is that way today on ships, okay? But my uncle was raised in a house where you do not uh, take the Lord's name in vain, you do not curse or use harsh language around women or men in that you're working with you never never do this and he did a lot of things in south america and they have a lot more manners of uh, genteel manners in many parts of south america you have to be careful so whenever he got frustrated and he was really just about to get mad all of a sudden he would say oh carrot <laughs> And I said, what is this carrot thing? And what had happened is we were hiking and we were on a trail 
and there was a lot of droppings that were still fresh and my my uncle stepped in them and he started screaming carrot 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 you know and this was just his way of just letting things go without any of the harsh words of course he's still being harsh i used to tell him that but he got over it later on when he, he sort of, he became a Buddhist, essentially, he became a Buddhist. And, and you know, he let most of everything go, even the carrot. But his recommendation was for when we were at the beach, when we were little children, he would come out and say, sugar beets. He dashed sugar beets like that. He just stepped on something. <laughs> You know, and he would say it, or he would get tar on his foot down by the beach and have to clean it off. <laughs> anyway, okay. The next one is right action, and it's practiced as harmonious movement of mind's attention. Each time that you never mind what you hear or you see and you smile, you are reminding yourself to keep mind's attention in an impersonal perspective. You're, what you're doing is pulling it over to the track and making it stay on track. You're just training it. You're doing nothing more than training like a horse to walk and then trot and then canter. When you're training horses, it takes a lot of patience. You have to get them so they can just walk when, and then you get on them and then they, train them to trot and then they won't walk and <laughs> it's very interesting. So you keep the mindful observation of attention going all the time. Keep practicing. Right effort by remembering to never mind, relax, smile whenever there is a rise in tension. You simply never mind unwholesome mind states and always replace them with wholesome mind states, keeping your smiling and a light mind going as much as possible, keeping your inner smile alive and keeping it well. So some people ask me sometimes, well, how do I know when two six R? If you're practicing the six R's properly, you're recognizing something is coming up and the Symptom for the arising of this hindrance is a change in tension as your attention is changing towards what it is. It's increasing in tightness. So actually, we all, I've always said this recently. We always say to you when we write, uh, your mind was pulled away by a hindrance. But the real question is, were you ever pulled away by a hindrance? Or did you let go of your interest in your, your friend or whatever object of meditation you had? You let your interest slip and your curiosity of what would come next. If you stayed with the friend, what would develop? You changed and you moved the attention, unconsciously moved that attention over to that whatever it was that arose. But there's nothing in it. There's no information there for you. We know that. We know that essentially what is popping up will only keep doing that and keep bothering you if you pay attention to it. So there's a nutriment involved in that hindrance and the right action for you uh, to do is to run the six R's and, and let let go and just let it fall away. Your attention fall away. Don't worry if it falls away. It can float around out here for all until it's tired and falls away. But it doesn't, this, these things up here are not going to bother you if you're just sitting there meditating. Let them be. They can't hurt you. They can't do anything to you. But don't feed them, okay? Next one, the fifth one is harmonious lifestyle and taking the time to smile and giving it away supports a positive living situation with people. The life continuum lesson is really important so that you live life in the present time. 
And this one had to do with, um, let me see, 130, there's three of them and they're all identical. It's really was so important that they preserved four suttas having to do with this. Um, and it, the suttas are 131, 132, 133, and 134. And there's one uh, set of prose in, that, in these four suttas, the same set of prose. And that's what the monks used to have to remember and memorize and teach the common person anywhere to recite this, to remember it. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let him see each presently arisen state. Let him know that and be sure of it, invincibly and unshakably. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come, who knows? It goes from there. But this front part is really your life continuum story about the past, about the future, Everybody, other than you guys teaching and training like this, most of the people in the public don't even realize that the past is not still here, stuck inside and can come up and down all the time and it's really the best. They don't understand that. And they think that if they worry enough about the future, uh, maybe they can create it. But it's the wrong idea about doing that. <laughs> because it's eating them alive in the present time so they can't work toward the future if it's weighing them down. So this is the one about uh, the lifestyle. Hey, did I, which one did I stop? May I stop on the one before this, right? I don't know, okay. Harmonious lifestyle. Oh, okay, how far did I get? Um, life continuum. Life continuum. Okay. Really important here. So you, you live life in the present time. This has to do with developing a new positive habit of smiling and gently saying to yourself, just never mind inside. And when you're laughing, you're not laughing at the other person if you're in an interaction. You're laughing at yourself because you allowed yourself to get caught again in something that was so clear. You see? You're laughing at yourself. It has to do with developing a new positive habit of smiling and gently saying, never mind, inside, and laughing more whenever the past or future creep in and trick you. In all situations in life, you want your smiling to support your daily life. And the strongest lifestyle is simple and positive thinking supports it. This is about letting things go more easily, developing patience and compassion with others. Also, it's setting up a lifestyle to support the practice, setting up the place you live, no matter how small it is, with a tiny altar, with a place you can sit and be still and quiet, or even the cat isn't gonna bother you if you put a shawl on your head a particular way. You know, I had a cat in, at one point, and once he knew though, if I put this one shawl on, he wouldn't bother me. The only thing he might do is come over, just sleep in my lap, but he would never, Paw at me or do anything. Well, you want everybody to treat you that way. You want to be left alone in a place to be alone, not lonely, to be alone. Big difference. Being alone is priceless and personal and precious for us. Loneliness is something we decide as a con negative condition. 
It's not real. We were told it was, but it isn't. Okay, yeah, harmonious practice, four steps of right effort. You know this part, seeing mind caught by an unwholesome thought or feeling and thinking first, never mind, as you number two, let go of the unwholesome thought feeling and relaxing and forgiving oneself. You relax the head and forgive yourself immediately. Then the most important part is you continue. And number three, smiling as you remember Anicca as you redirect this lighter mind back to the wholesome object, metta, and sending this to the direction of that person with a smile or to a task you're coming back to when you're teaching or music or you're teaching a child and dealing with them, come back and then you have to correct them and then you come back, see if you can do it real clean in a clean way. The last step is keeping the meta smile going and the lightness going and keeping an impersonal perspective. Great, okay. The seven harmonious observation this was right mindfulness, but we turned mindfulness into a specific skilled type of observation. You, as you smile, your mind remembers the nature of mind's attention when it's light and smiling. It remembers how this feels versus when tension and tightness arises and mind gets heavy and serious and pulled down. Notice how when you are caught by this, it is painful in your mind and it's painful in your heart. You remember what to do. Mindfulness helps you remember what to do. You practice your six R cycle and you keep smiling. And that's your seventh one. For the eighth one, the harmonious collectedness. Right concentration is practiced as a productive level of light concentration or collected or unified mind, however you want to say it, as long as you don't do it in a hard pointed way. I don't care which word you use. That keeps the practice running smoothly. Mind is alert, it's calm and composed. It is able to stay with the moment or the task in life without distractions or heaviness arising to pull it away. Smiling and laughing more easily with life is what helps with this tremendously. Okay, so that one, that one has to do with um, your meditation directly. And all of the things mentioned that in the in the first one we talked about, change to the positive direction if we use the second version with our practice. If we are keeping our precepts, a lot of those things are mentioned. And then everything comes into balance. But one is integrated in practice and in life. One is general for the whole community, for all, you can say, the humanistic preservation statement by the Buddhists for the community. That's what the first one was. Okay, the third one came about in 2000 and uh, I think 15. And this is when um, I, we figured out how, I figured out how to complete the entire Noble Eightfold Path in one smile. So this was a game we played. Can you write it down in a way where you can show that a person could actually complete the whole Eightfold Path if they were just smiling? So here, here's what happened. Could it really um, be true that a person could complete this in, in one smile? Back in 2015, I ran a meditation class on, at the Light of Asia Foundation. Uh, it's in Batramula area of Sri Lanka, a section of the city of Colombo. And uh, 
this was just before I came over for the first time to India. And after a few weeks of training, I asked these students to go home for one week and to practice applying the Noble Eightfold Path diligently during their day-to-day -day life. And when they came back from their next class, uh, for the next class, they, they took turns reporting how much each person had practiced the folds. And the first women, they told me they managed to practice the folds a few times each week. So I'm just gonna read to you exactly what came down here. Uh, finally, I got to the 12th student and a miracle happened. And here's what happened. This, this student was looking down and she reported that she had great remorse that she did not use the path during her days for that week. The other women had told me I did it once or twice. I remember doing something having to do with it on Wednesday. They gave answers like that and there wasn't anything certain. And I knew, I, I felt like I wasn't communicating to them strong enough how I wanted to explain it. So what happened with this girl was very important. A thought came up to me that I had personally left behind. I, I was a professional personnel counselor before I was a nun and I knew all about employment positions and what people did in their jobs because of the training and the experiences I had. So suddenly I asked this girl a question. What kind of work did you do? And she told me, I work as a customer service coordinator for a very large store. And I said, what part of customer service work do you do? I handle and I approve of all the returns for merchandise that come into the store. That's excellent, I thought. When you handle a return, I asked, do you have a handle? Or do you have to handle all of the complaints from the customers too as you're doing this? Yes, I handle about 50 to 70 people per day for all the level of merchandise returns in various accounts, large and small accounts. And when you do this work, do you smile? It was a simple question. For a moment, she paused and then energetically she smiled at me and told me that she had to smile all day long, no matter what was happening for the customers involved, because this was part of her job. I knew that. Can I ask you a few questions about this? And she said, sure. So when you serve a customer and you are smiling, do you take the problems that they are having personally? No, ma'am. I couldn't do that in my job. I must keep everything I do impersonal in this job. Okay, that's good. Do you keep wholesome images in your mind while you are, uh, while you are, working and smiling or do you think badly of the people who return things i keep smiling and that helps me to remember to see the customer go away happy not sad after the refund is given that's right good again now and and do do you use kind speech when you are dealing with the customers while doing your job Oh, yes, I do. However, the customer is treated, however the customer is treated produces the future reputation for the store. Excellent, I said. And are you paying attention to your own actions and sending kindness and sympathy to the situation of the customer who came in to return the items? Oh yes, I must be kind and thankful that they came to the store and begin with that and I must encourage them to come back and bring their friends for our service in the future. Do you need to keep smiling to accomplish this encouragement? Yes, ma'am, I do. Because they usually smile back and then instead of, be, uh, instead of becoming mean in, instead. I, I know about that, I said. So, so would you agree this, uh, this livelihood 
that you participate in provides you with a good and wholesome lifestyle. Oh yes, she said with a bright smile. Okay now, when you occasionally have a bad customer come in to do a large return, what do you do if they get a bit unwholesome with their behavior towards you and their speech? The customer is always right, she said. I sympathize with them and I let them know that they are right and I smile through whatever is going on because I know that it will pass soon. Good job, you seem to be turning things around in most of the situations pretty well. I bet that you can keep, you are keeping up with a lot of personal observations of each customer when they come in to see you what needs to be done for each one the right way. That's right, she said. Well, how about your level of concentration in your job? Do you use a very hard concentration or do you keep it light and impersonal so that you can see things clearly without a headache? Yes, well, you have been, well, you, you have been taught, you, you have taught me to lighten up in my job through my practice and my immediate response to someone speaking down to me is, is now something that I can deal with any time really well because I remember Anicha and I lighten up and I keep things impersonal. Well, you win, Joe. You're the one that wins. Win what? Well, there are no question in my mind that you have been practicing all week long on the daily basis, all eight points of the path. And I'm pretty sure that most of these others did more than expected too, but they didn't realize it also in their life because everyone was looking back at me in shock right now when I said that. The thing is that Joe thought that she did not practice what she has been learning for the past six weeks or so, and yet she was practicing all of it every day. And each time she smiled to calm a customer and give them her support, she was practicing harmonious perspective because she didn't take anything they said personally. And at all times, she kept harmonious images of success in her mind as she smiled. I did, she said. She kept a harmonious movement of mind's attention under control while she served each customer. She practiced a harmonious lifestyle no matter what happened and left any negatives that she experienced at work and she didn't take them home. She pursued her harmonious practice of right effort to let go of any objectionable things in the transaction and brought up supportive good things to replace them in her mind. She practiced a harmonious observation to establish what was essential and what was unessential because before she replied to any request. In fact, she kept a productive amount of concentration operating in her job. She applied a harmonious collectedness of mind, but she didn't get a headache anymore. When she first came to train, she was getting headaches all the time. The others were very happy uh, that one of the shyest students accomplished this so well. She was, the next time that we did this, uh, there was a new perspective that everybody used to interweave their jobs in life uh, with following of the Eightfold Path. Before I go into this little summary, I just wanna ask you guys how you feel about, about this Eightfold Path. Do you understand how you can use it in life? Do you get it? Do you see how it's working? Do you get the idea? May? Mr. Kim, I have a quick question mm -hmm. about the harmonious observation to establish what is, uh, so yeah, what is essential and what is unessential. So when we are at work, how, how do we establish, how do we know for sure what is essential and what is unessential? And Your guidepost is, is it coming from the past, the future, or the present? And what is actually the most essential thing? Think about this EMT, the emergency medical technician comes to an accident on the road. 
okay, gets out of the ambulance and pulls you out of the car and lays you down. You're in a lot of trouble if he starts thinking about things from the past or worrying about personal things in the future. In this situation, he has to stay just doing what he's doing in the present time. When you're teaching piano and you're dealing with children, um, when I was teaching piano, I was teaching voice to little kids for a while. And built, you know, I built those choirs. I told you about that. So when you're teaching people to sing and I'm dealing with one person, I cannot compare them to another person. Everybody is an individual. It's the best way to handle it, all right? But if I get, if I see a trait in Ulysses that I saw in Sunil and I start thinking about Sunil's trait and I'm dealing with Ulysses, I'm in trouble. I'm not being fair and I'm breaking the Eightfold Path, but more important than that, I'm getting involving unessential things in a present time situation. That's, that's all this is. You, you can come up with a hundred situations and we can talk about which is what it is and what it isn't. You can play with it. Mm -hmm. You okay? One hour, yeah. I just wanted to remind you. <laughs> that's good. That's very good. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I was so worried about this because it was long. That they... Okay, Ulysses, you had a question, yeah? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh, okay. How about you, Deepa? Any questions? No. You're okay? Okay. Um, now, so that's, that's what happens. Anybody else have any questions about this? Hmm? Okay. Let me look at one more thing. We'll go back to the share screen for a minute here. And we will look at um, the little summary that he, he made me write a summary one time to see if I could put it all in one piece. The summary is for how the Eightfold Path works and where it leads us all. The art of living begins through a selfless, harmonious perspective of whatever is happening in your life. We need to stop taking things personally. It helps us to ring up and keep wholesome imaging in our mind. We must learn how to investigate further to establish perfect harmonious communication with our mind and with others via our own thoughts words and actions. You need to watch how mind's attention impersonally moves without our asking it to and discover the value of encouraging a more harmonious movement of mind's attention. By letting go of things instead of taking them personally, you will reduce stress in life and develop a more harmonious lifestyle. As your smile begins to return, you are encouraged to pursue a harmonious practice all the time that the Buddha called right effort. He assured us that by releasing unwholesome tension filled mind states, relaxing our head and smiling as you return to wholesome, calmer mind states, you will find relief from suffering. Keeping this practice going, wherever and whatever we are doing, gradually helps us to notice how all phenomena impersonally arise and pass away. Perfecting the skill of harmonious observation will allow you to see clearly the true nature of everything, how life actually works. Gradually, you will achieve equanimity by balancing a softer, harmonious collectedness of mind, which in turn will lead you to repeat a practice 
that abandons snap reactions in life and replaces them with peaceful responses. We then begin to live our lives with more compassion and loving kindness to all beings. As we practice in this way, we are naturally shifting from a mind set for war to peaceful coexistence with the smallest to the largest life form on earth. This happens due to repetitious practice, personal experience, and clear understanding. It was this noble eightfold path that led the Buddha to the discovery to peace. He, his offering to us includes the promise of an eventual end to all suffering if we but pursue this same practice to repeat his experience by closely following his, his instructions. Okay, so this is concluding what you see, the three different setups to this. And when we go into the text, there's one more place that I noted, go into Sutta number three and I didn't put the page numbers, page 100. Sutta number three, section eight through 15 just to restate the objective of this. Friends, the evil herein is greed and hate. There is a middle way for abandoning of greed and hate, giving us vision, giving knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. What is this middle way? It is just the noble eightfold path. That is harmonious perspective, harmonious imaging, harmonious communication, harmonious movement of mind's attention, harmonious lifestyle, harmonious practice, harmonious observation and harmonious collectedness of mind. This is the middle way that is giving vision, giving knowledge, leads to peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and to Nibbana. The evil herein is anger and resentment, the contempt and insolence, envy and avarice, deceit and fraud, obstinacy and rivalry, conceit and arrogance, vanity and negligence. And this is the middle way for the abandoning of vanity and negligence and all such stage that give vision and knowledge leading to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. And what is the middle way? It is that noble eightfold path. And this middle way that's giving vision, giving knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, leads us to Nibbana. And that is what the Venerable Sariputta said. And the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted with the Venerable Sariputta's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So. Quick question. Is this from the um, um, Majjhima Nikaya? This, this yeah. sutta that you just read? Okay. Majjhima Nikaya number three. And it was section um, five to 21. 
eight, section eight to 15, it had repetitions. I didn't read all of the repetitions, but it had all the pieces. Yeah, okay. So that is, um, that's the way of looking in the most constructive way for your practice. When we look at any piece of what we're learning concerning the precepts, concerning the Eightfold Path, we first look at the knowledge of the truth in that part that we're reading about and studying. The second thing we do is we look at the knowledge of the task that is to be accomplished regarding that piece of the truth. In other words, if you don't steal, achieving happiness. You see, if you break a precept, that what else is it, what's happening that in the negative side? So you have the knowledge of the truth and knowledge of the task to be accomplished regarding that truth. And then you have the knowledge of the accomplishment of that task. That means when you practice it enough, it starts to become automatic. And when it starts to becoming automatic, then you've got something going because then your mind is getting senses. So how, how does it get to automatic? People ask me that. So how does it get to automatic? One, the first question is, why do you want it to get to automatic tomorrow when it took you 50 years to get really messed up? <laughs> and when I came to Bunty at 50 years old, I was really, you know, let's, let's get this thing straightened out. And he just sat there laughing one time and he said, it took you 50 years to get really locked in with your mind, what you, how you were going to react and how you were going to get concerned and what you, you were afraid of and your fears and everything else. Some monk comes along and says, you know, I can show you how to get rid of that. And then immediately because of the time you live in, you want instant gratification. That's it. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? And so why can't I have it? Why haven't you produced it for me in a special box? See, why can't I just buy this box and just open it up and there it is, right there. The solution all the way to Nirvana. Because it's a brain. <laughs> And brains have this, it's like saying, you know, when the child gets a really bad habit, and where did he get that habit, huh? <laughs> he got it from you. <laughs> you know, if he's saying these bad words, were you saying them in the kitchen? <laughs> and you know, when you were working in the garage, did he hear you saying those words? And all of a sudden you're upset because they're saying these naughty words, but wait a minute. <laughs> But that's when it began, and it began with you. And then you take all these years to really lock it in place, and some nun like me comes along and says, you know, you can have a lot more fun without a headache and without a lot of distress if you simply never mind and let go and relax and smile and come back. What are you letting go of? The problem is you're letting go of stuff that was there from the past. Now, this can be a situation you have with somebody right now. And if it's a situation with somebody that you are involved with right now, a lot of times when I say, why aren't you letting go of the past? I mean, at lunchtime, why aren't you taking that person to lunch just because they spilled coffee on your desk in the morning? <laughs> You know, the morning was the morning and this is right now. And then you've got the evening. So you have these scenarios of people. I don't know which one each one of you fits into, but um, I had one man who absolutely carried everything to work with him and had miserable mornings until he finally got to an hour before lunch and he had some good time working and then he got to lunch and then in the afternoon, he dreaded for another extra hour there going back home. 
but when he had problems at work, he put them, you know, it's like, let's say this little box is our, um, is our little car, this little box. And you know, wait a second, something happened at lunch. Let's put this, let's put this in here. Here we go, put that in there. <laughs> and, and then, you know, somebody yelled at me. They yelled at me at lunch. Okay, let's, let's take that, let's take this in. Let's put this one, let's put that in there too. Okay, put that in there. And then, you know, this happened to me and they, they pulled my car and they took it away because I parked in the wrong place. Oh my gosh, I'll put that one in there too. You know, <laughs> because when you get home, what you really want to do for the beautiful relationship with that beautiful wife or that handsome husband is to go in there and just tell them about all of this stuff. <laughs> tell them about this and not even thinking that they've been over there and going through a bunch of stuff too. And what both of you forgot is the sanctity of the home. <laughs> when you set up a door to come in your house, please, Go to the store and get an old fashioned farm uh, piece of wood with some hooks on it for your coat. And even if you don't have a coat in this weather, when you go inside, just pretend to take your hat off and put it on the rack and take your coat off and hang it on the hook before you walk in the other room and say, hi, how you doing? And in that coat and in that hat has to be all that stuff that happened at the office. Leave it alone. Don't take it home. There's no reason for it. At least listen to the other person before you give it all to him. Maybe you listen to his <laughs> and she listens to yours. I don't know. But share some time just venting. If that's what you need after going through a hard day, well, then make a deal. 10 minutes to vent each way. Okay, fine. But then, you know, and if you're smart, I'm telling you guys, if you're smart and you had a really bad day, get some flowers on the way home. I'm telling you, <laughs> get some flowers. And if you never did it before, well, I know what happened. One guy, I told him to get the flowers and take them home. And the first thing she said, okay, what's going on? <laughs> Because he never bought her flowers before, you know. Okay, what's going on? <laughs> you know, but people love these things. Next, and my son asked me one time a long time ago, he said, this is the woman I'm going to marry, so what am I supposed to do when I give him flowers? Well, I told him, what colors does she like? She likes, she likes red and she likes yellows. Okay, then you get one dozen yellow roses and one red rose in the middle. And you give that to her, see what happens. He did, they got married. <laughs> they have one little one now. <laughs> and of all places for them to be, they're in Seattle. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, but anyway, this is, this is fine. Seattle's a wonderful place, I'm sure, most of the time. <laughs> Okay, but these things that are in the Eightfold Path are there, especially for you to remember. And when I was starting to learn all this, I had a hard time um, remembering because I had a, an accident with a brain injury part partially and it was bad. And so this woman in California, you know, she made a bracelet for me. And it was really kind of fun. I made a necklace first, and the necklace had, um, it had um, 23, 23 beads on it, and then a white one and a white one, and then it had um, five for the precepts in another color, and a white one, and it had the four noble truths. So that was the four noble truths, the five precepts, and um, there was a three in there someplace for the you know, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And I was learning all these pieces. I mean, you people have a lot of pieces, <laughs> a lot of pieces to learn. And but so you, you, I wore the necklace and I used to just take it off and just do my own thing with these beads to learn the dependent origination pieces. And then when I say 23 pieces, I'm talking about transcendental dependent origination 
which is a little different. It's the same 12 links, but then it also includes the uh, parts that are the development for your meditation from the beginning to the end. And that was called Transcendental Dependent Origination from the Upani Upanisa, Upanisa Sutta, okay? And that one is on page 553, I think it is, of the Samyutta Nikaya. I'm pretty sure it's 553. I can check for you. Um, pretty sure. Yeah, I'm good. 553. In the Samyutta Nikaya, it's called Proximate Cause. And this it's in um, <clears throat> Nidana Samyutta, which is the book about of causation, the book of causation. And it's Sutta number 23, and then in parentheses 3. 23 parentheses, three unparentheses, okay? But it's on page 553. It's a really beautiful sutta because of the last verse of the sutta is very precious. And somebody says, well, how are we supposed to learn all this stuff? Can we learn it immediately? I need it right now and all the rest of that to me, you know? And then I say, listen to this. Listen to what the Buddha said about this. Just as the monk, just, just as bhikkhus, when rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the water flows down along the slope and it fills the clefts and gullies and creeks. These being full, they fill up the pools. And these being full, fill up the lakes. And these being full, fill up the streams. And these being full, fill up the rivers. And these being full, fill up the great ocean. So too, with ignorance as condition, formations come to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the six sense doors come to be. With the six sense bases as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies come to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, the birth of reactions come to be. With the birth of reactions come to be aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. But when ignorance does not come to be, formations do not come to be. When formations do not come to be, consciousness does not come to be. When consciousness does not come to be, mentality, materiality does not come to be. When mentality, materiality does not come to be, the six sense spaces do not come to be. When the six sense spaces do not come to be, conscious contact does not come to be. When contact does not come to be, feelings do not come to be. When feelings do not come to be, craving does not come to be. When craving does not come to be, clinging does not come to be. When clinging does not come to be, habitual tendencies do not come to be. When habitual tendencies do not come to be, birth of reaction does not come to be. When birth of reaction does not come to be, 
sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Thus is the end of this whole mass of suffering. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So that's your chain. Do you remember much about your seven links? Do you have your seven links? Hmm? If you know your seven links pretty well, one of the ways you can, that's interesting to think about them now is just to consider how do you heal when you start to change, for instance, a pattern of anger. When we, um, you know, I can't, I probably can't put these, I probably can't put these on, I have to go find these files, but what you're looking at is a picture of a wheel that is spinning. This is a wheel that is spinning, and these are the 12 links, and they're spinning. And then some monk comes along, <laughs> and he says to you, you know those, those, uh, those, those things that are spinning like that, they're spinning in the wrong direction. That was actually built inside of you to spin in the other direction. And you, what are you talking about, you know? And then he says, well, once we change the direction, we begin with the aging and death. We're able to track backwards and we look at it. He examined it in the other direction and he figured out the links himself by examining aging and death was the suffering. So the cause of the aging and death was the the birth, the birth, and we say the cause of the suffering is the birth of your reactions and taking things personally. It's all wound up, you see, with the three characteristics too. It's sort of, you remember the characteristics, okay, are like anicca, dukkha, anatta. So anicca is the impermanence and the changing all the time. The dukkha is the suffering, okay, and then the anatta is the way out, the impersonal nature of everything. It's the way out. So let me take this, this little wheel and go to the next wheel. And now the next question is, how does a person change from suffering? How do they change from suffering where the wheel is spinning like that. I mean, this is showing you this rope and the rope is hooked onto the wheel. And the first thing you wanna to try to look at is you want to stop the birth of the reaction. So if somebody's yelling at you and your tendency is to yell back every time, then the first place you wanna hook the rope on the wheel is you wanna make a conscious decision your own affirmation and determination. When today, when I go to work, no matter what they say to me, I'm not going to yell back. And you start to giggle when it, you'll feel it inside. It will want to come up. It will want to push out. It will want to happen. But you will look at that, so I'll be darned. Look at that tension. Look at that tightness inside me. It's pushing up, trying to make me do this. I'm not going to do it today. Ha, ha, ha. See, and you, do, you don't do that. But then after that happens, you notice something. You notice that the reason that you were giving birth to that reaction by giving up the birth of the reaction is not enough. So you try to hook the rope on the next one back. And that one was clinging. No, habitual tendency, sorry, habitual tendency. So you hook the rope on the door to the library. You're going to tear that library down. You do not want to live your life like a robot where you just react the same way. You know, it's awful. I met a woman once and she had like, I don't know, eight or 10 boyfriends. But if you talk to any of the boyfriends, if you got to talk to them, 
you would hear them describe exactly how she was with each one of them, and each one of them couldn't believe it. But her tendencies and her patterns of living were just anti-male, so to speak. And the same problem was happening over and over and over and over again. And why she wanted to have a boyfriend was just because everybody had a boyfriend. In the end, she didn't really need a boyfriend. <laughs> you know, it's like that way. But anyway, uh, the point here is that her habitual tendencies, you're not going to succumb to being pulled in your mind, even for a second, to say, oh, look, this is just like when so-and-so yelled at me before. I'm going to yell back and then have the birth of reaction. So you stopped it again, one more back, right? But you still realize something. You realize clinging was the story about all of the reasons why you don't like it when somebody yells at you. And that one is back a little bit further. So it didn't work when you hooked this onto the habitual um, tendency so now you hook it on to the clinging. And now if you can see what happened in this picture, when you hooked it onto the clinging, you popped the spoke out and you pulled the spoke out of the wheel for clinging and habitual tendency. So what happens in the next picture is now you are gonna experiment with this. I mean, you'll be the first one to admit to me you might not ever reach Nibbana, but that doesn't mean that I can't stop craving sometimes. And if I know what craving is and I can identify it and sense it and I understand the anatomy of it and how it works, at least you can shut it down for half a day. You can actually stop craving. But when you put that on the craving link, look what happens when you pull the wheel. That wheel is not going to run very much at all anymore because it's about to fall into pieces and just collapse on the ground. Because the moment that you refuse to crave, you will not cling. And when you do not cling, you will not habitually react. You'll be forced. You locked the door. You destroyed the library. Maybe you blew it up. Who knows, okay? But when you destroyed that library of reactions the way you always do it, it puts you in a position when you feel that going like that, okay, what am I going to do? Now, here's a key piece. There's two key pieces in anger, okay? Number one, if I yell at you, Ulysses, and just call you the stupidest student on this whole screen. <laughs> That's you just did the right thing. You started laughing. <laughs> you started laughing, okay? The moment he's laughing, he's not even mad at me for saying that, okay? He's not mad, he can't be. The, the, the rule is the brain can only do one thing at a time, as magnificent it is, as powerful as it is, as fast as it is, and it can run an electric train. But I don't think it can be mad at its mother if it's running the electric train. <laughs> you know, it can only do one thing at a time. See, this is an interesting thing. So number one, it can only do one thing at a time. Fact, okay? Second thing, that means if you're angry and you decide to laugh at it, you're not angry anymore, immediately. That anger is gone and you are now laughing. That's real, absolutely real, okay? So that's, that's the way that you immediately stop it and then you change the subject. Where do you go? Well, you have plenty of material now to understand. You go into the little bubble of meta, so the meta is around you and it protects you. Nothing can hurt you. You put a meta bubble around you and you put compassion toward the other person. You, you, are, you forgive them, forgive them immediately. Don't carry this home, just forgive them. It doesn't mean you have to take them out to dinner or you have to take care of them or pay for their future. <laughs> it just means forgive them, you know? <laughs> you, it's a heavy duty thing, just forgive them. And somebody said, why do I have to forgive? And, and my, my answer was, why not? <laughs> why not? 
You see, you can't explain to me why we're all fighting in this world. Nobody can explain to me why we're all fighting in this world. You have everything you need. All you have to do is take care of it the right way and you all will survive. There's plenty of food, there's plenty of water, and there's plenty of space. Don't go there with me about space. But the misusage and the fighting and the greed and the hatred and desire and the arguments from years ago keep us from sharing. It's the most disorderly kindergarten room in the universe. <laughs> okay, it's a kindergarten room. And you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what it is. So I don't know who will ever get up there. Someone told me I should put white on. I don't want to wear white. I like my brown forest thing, you know, and, and I'm having enough trouble, <laughs> you know, but you get put white on, have them cover you with flowers. And say, Why are you fighting? Why is everybody? And then I think if they asked me to do it, I would just, I wouldn't go on a hunger strike. I would keep eating. But when I'm not eating, I would cry. I'm wondering, you know, I'll tell you a story. Once when I wanted to go to Taiwan, I was only 18 years old. My husband went to Taiwan in the military and he was low rank. So they weren't going to pay for me to go. I had to save my money to go. So I saved my money and I was going to go. I went to get the visa. I went to New York to get the visa and I found out something about Taiwan that changed my life. <laughs> I found out that a woman inside an Asian, uh, an Asian uh, visa office, consulate office in any country in the world, a woman who sits down and cries her eyes out can have anything she wants. <laughs> And so they gave me my visa at the desk and I went to pick it up and it was for one year and I sat down in the chair and I had been there for four and a half hours and I started crying. And you know, it wasn't 30 minutes. They took that visa out of there. They changed it to a four year visa and they gave it back to me and said, bye, go get some dinner. <laughs> and all I had to do was cry. <laughs> And probably somewhere, I, I, they're probably not alive anymore, the people that were there, they were pretty old. But if they're alive, they're looking at me now and they're laughing. <laughs> you know? But this was just a simple thing, you see? So maybe, I don't know what would happen, but somebody should cry because we have everything we need. We have blue skies. You notice Mumbai, you know, and probably Delhi too, they have blue skies. Why? Because you turned all the cars and trucks off. You said there could never be blue skies. We can never solve the pollution, but you solved the pollution. You turned the trucks off and everybody went in the house. Somebody told me in Mumbai, nobody talks about this. There are fish. Can you imagine fish in the canals? There are fish. Do you know how come I'm like that? Because, because the canals were the color of purple milk. They were so infected and nothing lived in the canals at all in Mumbai. It was just trash and garbage. But after about two months or three months, someone came and told me there are little fish in the canals. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> you hear the fish down there in the ocean? We're all going to move back up the canal. <laughs> They're all going to get uh, new, lo new locations up the canal. We, I don't understand why we can't share. So as a mother, it's a mystery, and it's an old mystery all mothers have, I guess. So you need to tell me now the next uh, class we're going to do is going to be on the fo a foundation subject. Um, this, we use this, this class that we built, we used it as one of the foundation pieces. It wasn't supposed to happen for a while, but we did it now. So we put that in, in line in the, in the order of it. And on Saturday, um, I'm going to do, um, uh, a class about the, um, the glossary because you want to know about words now a lot of people aren't here this time but 
Um, a lot of people have written me about the glossary, so it's a pretty good idea to take the words and look at where they, where they are so that you learn how our definitions work, okay? Okay. So is everybody happy? <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, that's good. So we should say our blessing. Does anybody have any questions? Any last minute questions? What is the topic for Wednesday? Um, uh, the talk for Wednesday, I'm going to pull, a, I didn't, I can send you a note. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I also, I also need to contact you anyway. So when I call, I'll call you tomorrow, if that's okay. Try to call okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Yeah. There will be a foundation topic for the, um, subject on Wednesday. There will be enough time for questions too. This was good. I mean, this was pretty good tonight. I thought it was going to take a lot longer. <laughs> so I'm glad about this. Okay. So let's say our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shall shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect this Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.